Hello, hello. My name is April Malone with Yes, I Work From Home, and this is a podcast. Today, I have Janet McKenna-Lowry from Massachusetts with us. She is in a snowstorm right now, and so was super available to interview today. Janet, do you want to take it away and introduce yourself and let us know what you're doing with your tax school? Yes, April, what a pleasure, and so nice to meet you in, in sort of an unexpected way. Um, I work, I run a tax school, which is always very funny because people want to ask me questions about taxes. I know very little about taxes, but I know a lot about running a school and an educational program. So what we do is that tax preparers need to have 72 credits with the IRS to remain licensed. So 72 across three years. And we are a place where they get those credits. And I say we because I do have a business partner. And we are all online. We used to be when when my business partner, when I started, my business partner had been doing it for several years by then. But it used to be a live in-person two-day event at a hotel. There were eight of them across the state. And I was hired to be an event coordinator, which was fine. I went, I handed everybody their books. I let them in, I registered them. I made sure that they attended because that's the thing that the IRS wants. And then COVID happened. And the university that we used to work with thought that the program was finished. And we said, no, we've actually already made it an online program. So we do two live Zoom webinars. And then I take the recordings, I take the better recording of the two and I um, edit it so that the IRS likes the way it, <laughs> it comes together. The IRS has a bunch of rules. I'm sure you'll be surprised to know. And then when it is in that condition, uh, people can watch it whenever, you know, our students can watch it whenever they want, take a short quiz and get their credits. So that's really, we're all about making sure that tax providers get, tax preparers get the kind of credits that they need to remain you know, happily registered and <laughs> happily certified. So you're coordinating with teachers and you're helping provide the service of the school, but you're not the one that's actually delivering the content? That's correct. So I do pretty much the whole infrastructure from, well, actually, originally my business partner was the one with the relationships with the teachers. I mean, I had a friendly relationship with them, but I didn't search for them or anything else. But um, this past year after, so we, we detached from the university, we created our own business to keep providing this because we knew the students still needed it, even if the university wasn't going to do it. And then my business partner got very, very sick. She had a brain tumor last year. So oh. yeah, and she's okay. She made it through. Oh wow! But, but it meant that I was now doing the hiring, which is a real trip when you don't really know your topic deeply so right just, you're looking for me. excellent teaching methodology and knowledge and experience in education and so I had this workaround of looking at every community college in this I, I limit limited myself to the state of Mass, Commonwealth Massachusetts just because I had to start somewhere every community college that had an accounting program that seemed to do anything with taxes then I would look up those people on Rate My Professor. And if they got a four oh. or five, I cold called them and begged them to teach. Oh, wow. So you weren't able to, at that point, um, do like an evergreen model where you could just reuse the recordings? Because is it the tax laws are changing every year and they have to stay abreast? It's exactly that. The tax laws change every year. Not only that, but when you do your 72 credits, they can't be repeats. Ah. They have to be, so you, there's no real... Um, there's no advantage in recycling anything from another year because students couldn't retake them. So, yeah. Um, so we did great. We hit all of our benchmarks this past year. And um, we, I, I would really lucked out actually in those couple of teachers that I had to find on the fly because combined with our previous teachers who came back to work for us because they, they love doing what they do. We really have a, uh, baseline of are you good at teaching online mm, yeah change and and there is a proportion of people who really 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 wishes we'd go back to the two-day mm -hmm. hotel things um and the problem is the venues don't allow you to pack them the way they used to and food has gone up 400 percent right so 
Um, and and in any case, whenever we did do those, the bottom line, it's like running a little wedding every for like eight times because uh, you sit there and you go, oh, that venue is not too expensive. Then you look at the venue and you go, okay, that's that's pretty doable. And then you look at the contract and you see what the uh, labor costs are oh. and the other fees and the taxes. Mm-hmm. And just like a wedding, you go, oh, oh no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. They'll get you with all the... Um, like you're required to have this kind of service or this kind of catering. Yeah. And minimums, which means if everyone gets sick with COVID or anything else, you're, you're out. still stuck. So we're pretty committed to always, even if we were to ever have an in-person thing, we actually tried to do some hybrid ones this, this year and they flopped like a lead balloon. But if, but in any case, we are committed to always having the online webinars and a self-study component. If we ever do live again, it would be just as sort of a fun little thing. This is Mm -hmm. better for, it's funny, except for the people that wish it were live. And I get that. I get the impulse. I like live theater too. But um, the problem is this is available to anybody everywhere that we don't have to commute. The lady that was on Nantucket in a storm and missed half of a weekend and then couldn't, we couldn't refund her. We had run the program. I there was no other she could go to, you know. Those oh no! Kinds of sort of Did that mean that she can't get certified or re? It, she she had to find courses elsewhere than ours because at that time the way the university ran it, we couldn't do anything else. Hmm. Now I say, well, we have the, you know, first of all, it's available to you. You can log on from wherever you are. I've mm-hmm. had people log on from Florida in the sun. But the second thing is, if you did miss it for some reason, you were sick or uh, had something else happen you can take the self-study. And we did all of that in COVID. We actually really blossomed in COVID, honestly. And that was when my work at home got really full-time and intense. Like, you know, and I've worked uh, from home for about 10 years, all things considered. And before that, I tried as much as possible to work from home when I had Mm -hmm. younger kids. Mm -hmm. And, but in terms of like consistently doing work from home, it's been about the last uh, 10 years. But the university job, made me go in sometimes and of course I had to go to these different venues Mm -hmm. but that COVID year which was my second year working with the program was suddenly absolutely wonderful I mean you know I I wore my sweatpants and a very nice blouse and I was the admin for the zoom things and then it it just it made you know I, I I would go and do all my editing just sitting outside the library on the patio um where they had a, uh, an internet connection. I could go, uh, I could go be anywhere and I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. So um, one of the questions that's come up in my mind is you said originally when everyone was meeting in person, you ha- one of your jobs was to ensure that people were attending in person and sticking around. So how are you handling the self-study? Um, is the IRS accepting? Did you have the to go I- through a process? <laughs> the IRS, uh, you know, I gotta say, I, I've changed a lot, my opinion about the IRS. I, you know, I always felt kind of generally hostile to it because it's a big bureaucracy. It wants my money. It wants to like, it want, I always felt like the IRS wanted me to do math or like flunk me and then come after me if I didn't. It doesn't. It <laughs> I think doesn't. a lot of people feel that way still. Right. And from this side of things, they have been absolutely wonderful. And okay. so they were su- surprisingly fast at like responding and approving everything. and approving. And so what they did is they were like, okay, well, you can use uh, the Zoom polls, but they're only up for one minute. And if, uh, if people don't, uh, if for every one hour, one credit hour, which is 50 minutes, I think they have to fill out, I think they have to do three um, polls. You can do more if you want. And I mean, ultimately we have, you have to do five, four out of the six, I believe is the minimum. Maybe it's five out of the six. I'd have to, to make sure butts are in seats and paying attention sure and on the ball. Seats. Exactly. Exactly. And when I asked the IRS, when I, I, I talked to a wonderful guy, when I was kind of doing it on my, on my own, because my partner was sick, I ended up <laughs> having long conversations. Plus we had to recertify because we were no longer affiliated with the university. Oh, right. So I had all these long talks with this wonderful guy at the IRS. And I said, okay, okay, but, and this will come up uh, as a thing to talk about later. A lot of our students are older 
and what if they have problems doing the poll question or what if there's and I said can 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 we do a an accommodation of like a timestamp on an email if that's the case and he was like you know insert as long as you've made a special circumstance as long as you've announced it as long as it's kind of in writing and in a policy you can't have all your students do that but mm-hmm. you can do that and so stuff like that where i was like thank you they were totally willing to work with that for the quiz it is what i always call a painless quiz um you can take it as many times as you want uh, so and and people actually don't even have to take hilariously oh my dog is walking around hilariously you could if you knew the material well enough you could just slide in and take the quiz and get the credits Mm -hmm. but most people want to be informed like our students are really it's one of the nice things about this crew that I have for students they want the education they're not Mm -hmm. they're not looking to just you know skive off and get some credits so um but they so they watch the video they watch the video the zoom that I made that um you know, co- coordinates with the IRS link and things like that. And then they take the quiz and then they get their credits. Just And actually, I've automated all of that using Google Suite, which I am a big fan of. Good for you. Are you using like the Google Classroom option? Yes. Okay. That's exactly what I'm doing. So the quizzes come through that. Yeah. So I have a 12-year-old and one day she came to me and she's like, mom, can I make a Google Classroom. And I was like, actually, for my adult education job that I have, I'm supposed to do like a 16 hour course in learning how to run one. I've gone through, you know, some conference lectures on the topic, but I haven't ever really created one. Um, And she's like, yeah, mom, I'll do that with you. And then I've just been putting it off. So we need to (laughs) learn that. And hopefully the 16 hours will get us a head start. But I'm like, why do you want to make a Google Classroom? She's like, I just want to know how it works. So awesome. she's had, she has to use it as a, a user, you know, in her school. I love that. I love when kids go, well, I really love this video game. And then they're like, how do I pop the hood? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so what else changed when you went from the university to online? Well, uh, I found actually, that was very funny. I, I realized this year that like, I was still doing some of the sort of structure that the university had required or had already implemented. And I was like, I don't have to do that anymore. All right. And one of those things was the realization that a lot of the registration that I had done, I was still registering as if they were face-to-face where I needed to know which one they're coming to. I need to know the numbers. I need to tell the venue how many people are coming and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. With the webinars, I mean, they can be huge. Mm -hmm. And people would, people would contact me and be like, oh, wait, can you switch me to this other one? Or can I switch to um, self-study? And I, I mean, it took me, it took me, I'm, I'm ashamed to say a very long time to realize I don't care which ones you go to. The, the back end will tell me that you were there. Like, I'll, okay. The attendance will tell me you attended. So when I set it up for this coming year, it's going to be much more like, well, you're in the program, you're taking the seminar and just come just come whenever you want to come to whatever you want to come to you know and I will know because I will have the records on the other side and that's actually going to free up I want to say probably about 12 15 percent of my time was oh my goodness that's awesome in their registrations and uh, yeah yeah and eventually I got to the point of being like oh here's a link to a google spreadsheet with all the links but people still were like wait this isn't how we used to do it can you tell me now it's just gonna be like everything you're given everything you can look at you You pick choose your own adventure yeah I just don't I don't need to be in the business of knowing where you went I will know where you went when it matters and when I'm doing all the, all the cleanup at the other end and giving you your credits. And so I actually have a master's degree in adult education. Uh And one of the things that you learn in, I'm going to say it wrong. Is it andragogy? How do you say it? Help me. Pedagogy versus, Oh, Oh, I don't know. What's the versus there's another one is for adults and it's like andragogy or something like that. I just, totally biffed that but um it starts with the a and d as children i always use it as the same word well it's actually more of um the difference in how it's delivered um pedagogy is more uh teacher led and driven um i will teach you and you will receive my information 
And the adult education model is more of group experience, working off of your previous experience. It's more self-led, self-directed, hands-on, and um, giving people a certain amount of autonomy. And okay. so when you're telling them, hey, choose your own adventure, you have three links. You can do this one, that one, or the self-study. Make yeah. your own choice. You're an adult. Yeah, um, knock yourself out. <laughs> it gives people like that empowerment. Oh yeah, I am an adult. I am going to choose what's best for me and I'm going to do this well. So it's really interesting you should bring this up because this was a deep conversation we had all the time when I was, uh, so I got my uh, master's degree six years ago. I was 50 years old. And I went to Ireland, I went to Dublin, Ireland, and I went to Trinity College. Oh, that's so fun. Adventure. It was so much fun. I had and it's St. Patrick's Day this week. So how right? fitting. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Uh, and so it was a one-year program. So September to August it was terrific. And I don't know if it was just our cohort or what. There are large age gaps, right? There's a bunch of people who got out of college, worked for a couple of years, and want to get an MBA. That was my experience too with yeah. adult education. It was a yeah. like a 30, 40 year age gap. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, I was the oldest. And then, but my, my nearest was there were like three guys that were just in a year or two, two younger than me. And one of those guys is a phenomenal uh, Pentagon, Department of Defense guy. Yeah. West Point educated. So great. And we had these really interesting discussions about feedback. I, I became a class rep. And feedback to the admin and the staff about what was and what was not appropriate for adult education in terms of expectations and sort of uh, philosophies mm -hmm. in that we, we ended up with a couple of people who were very used to molding young minds and, and couldn't handle that they were talking to peers or people who were even older than him, them. Oh, right. Absolutely. Of experience. And we were like, ah, yeah, this isn't working for us. Or they would set up assignments that would make a lot of sense if you were an undergraduate or working in an undergraduate team. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't do those games anymore. We're mm -hmm. just gonna, you know, it was just, it was yeah. very, very interesting. We got into great discussions about adult education and the difference. The assumptions. Absolutely. I've been attending um, some conferences for my adult education program. And it's so interesting doing the breakout sessions where one is very interactive, very hands-on. Um, we're going to, you know, take this piece of information and now let's all, you know, as an integrated, you know, team, let's add to it and participate. And I don't know, just build something. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then we'll go back to the lesson and then we'll come back and do it. And a lot of times we're just basically doing what we would have our adult learners do. Um, and then every once in a while you'll attend a lecture and the lady is just like talking down to you. Yes. Like, or reading the slides. Um, yeah. And I, and, and like even the mannerisms that she was using this one lady, um, I just kind of felt like she's talking to us as though we don't know, like we don't yeah. understand or that, I don't know, it just, it had a different feel. And or Q and A's where they're working from an assumption that you have never worked in any of this, you know, these professional environments before because you're 22 and you're like, we are like, uh, we're going to yeah. get in here. <laughs> well, and like in my program, I was working with a lot of managers and people who were in training and development. Um, now in my adult education program, I'm working with um, an immigrant population. A lot of people who are learning oh. English as a second language. Um, some of these people are very educated and skilled yes. with robust work history in their native, you know, language and country. But um, when I see people presenting like that, it makes me wonder, are you talking down to your students? Well, one of the one of the people that was about my age was a guy who had retired after running a multi-billion dollar corporation in Japan. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, maybe, maybe because of cultural things, personality, mm -hmm. and language, he's not going to jump up and jump in when someone is condescending to him. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the instructor has not been extremely condescending to him. Oh, wow. So, you know, some things like that. We, we ironed it all out. It was good, but it really, like, evolved into these interesting conversations that mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is good. Um, and and I, how? Yeah, go ahead. How has that inspired the way that you're delivering this content? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, in the sense that I, I think just that sort of structural, uh, honestly, the structural uh, um, things that that support the content is really my job. And and I actually just went to a conference with a bunch of people who run these kinds of programs across the country. They all work out of universities in this particular crew that I was with, and I was like, your your emphasis on in per <laughs> my dog shaking your in emphasis on in person and lecture style is handicapping you because it is even though you're saying well it's very unlimited it's not it's very limited it's a lot of it's in person even the lectures that they were doing online were done as if it was a college lecture hmm. and it was like adults don't not only don't need that it is often counterproductive for them. Whereas this idea of saying, well, if I can't make this Tuesday, I'll come up next Thursday. Oh, I don't even have to tell anyone. I can just go. Ah, now that is exactly what we're talking about, which is structurally, it allows them to get the information on their own timetable. And then that, we, we got into some really interesting discussions, this, this conference about self-study. And I am such a proponent and I'm a proponent for two reasons. The first is that I'm going to say pedagogical, though now I know it's not quite the right word, but that um, access to learning of like, it's your time. Some people said, well, I used to love having the two day seminars and I go, well, that's fine. Wait until they're all out and then just sit there and do two days of watching all the all mm -hmm. the self-studies and then take them. You're good. Do you, do you roll them out time? like hour by hour or how do you do it? I roll them out a week after each, after the second webinar. Okay. just to give me time to edit. But the other piece of that I was going to say that I really love is as a content provider or as a um, customer service person, which is what I end up doing as, as well, it's really nice to be able to tell people, look, don't stress about it. If, if, if you can't make either of those dates, if you forgot the other date, if your computer was dead, your wife was sick, your dog threw up, you can still do self-study. It yeah. all is not lost. If you if you signed up after three of them passed, it's okay. All is not lost. So that's also almost, I mean, I know it's not quite the delivery or the idea of like adult education, but it is in terms of being able to tell people this will suit you. Let's get this to suit you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, uh, I'm going to look up this word so I can like, <laughs> listen. Andragogy. 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 Oh, I, I should have known that. It's been a few years since I got my master's degree. <laughs> so andragogy is a method and practice of teaching adult learners adult education. And there is, I mean, there are six principles. Let's see. Include self-direction, transformation, experience, mentorship, mental orientation, motivation, and readiness to learn. Um, there was a guy named Knowles at probably wrote those um i can't remember if there's newer versions of that i'll have to look into that more but um yeah. interesting home, stuff to learn i homeschooled my kids off and on all each of them probably about i think i figured it out once eight years nine years of their school careers ultimately i was homeschooled for seven and i would argue those were the those were actually the the guidelines for any kid oh yeah that, Actually, I wrote a paper um, when I was in grad school about the common ground between um, homeschool, no, was it Montessori, the Montessori method mm -hmm. and, um, and adult education with, you know, a lot of that self-directed learning. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, um, I, so the tax school is interesting because it is very intense on the other side of the year. It's very intense from maybe midsummer to uh, the holidays and okay. everything happens in there. So that leaves this side of my year way more flexible and open. And I do other things, but while well, these people the are actually doing their taxes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but during the height of like COVID when that, that final year doing it for the university, I actually did a, well, I have, I have a podcast that's on hiatus, but a lot of my podcast was around comforting and talking to parents who work at least 20 hours a week. And it, it didn't have to be working from home, but work at least 20 hours a week mm -hmm. and homeschool their kids because mm -hmm. so many 
people were finding themselves having to have their kids home learning. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really interesting to have these conversations about how if you think you're going to replicate school at home, it's going to be that, I guess, the pedagogy method, perhaps, rather than mm -hmm. the andragogy. It's going to try to recreate something that actually doesn't leverage the enthusiasm of the kids. So if you want a much more organic and uh, pleasant time, you can, you know, benefit from homeschoolers who have been doing this for years of mm -hmm. how you might just pause the school school since they're not getting any uh, socialization out of it anyway, mm -hmm. and really double down on what does your kid like to do. And Absolutely. You know, if, if it's going to be Legos, then one, one parent had figured out that her husband was a um, sound music, music editor. Mm -hmm. And so the kid kind of became aware of how, how music looks on a on a you know on a visual the, whenever you edit but then they had also taken the legos a set of legos and they had created quarter notes and half notes and they did they did this whole thing about reading music and understanding music as a mathematical exercise absolutely and, and fractions in the kitchen too right yeah and that kid showed up every day wanting to do projects yep like there was no forcing there was no i can't get to my work because my kid needs there was no make you sit down for eight hours. It was all this kid being like, we, I could recombine this. And I, you know, absolutely different beat. Yeah. We only homeschooled um, temporarily um, when I was trying to work 20 hours a week or more. And um, I was trying to manage three different zoom schedules for three different kids doing online school and all their paperwork. And finally one day on the hundredth day of school, when the funding starts to drop off, um, I took them out and I was like, we're going to read books. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn from YouTube and we're going to play games. And so we did game schooling. Oh, I love it. And other things too, of course, um, obviously when you're homeschooling in non-pandemic times, you can, you know, utilize a lot of field trips sure. um, and other social things. I, I, I grew up in a homeschool environment and I would just do all my work a little bit faster and then have like a three or four day weekend. There you go. Yeah. For skiing. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did all sorts of experimental things like, does it work better for everybody if we just do like math on Mondays and Tuesdays and then we do all the other stuff on the other days? How does that work for everybody? We did mm -hmm. that for months. So that's what I liked about it. I had one person that I talked to who had this great story about it, um, her daughter who was obsessed with horses. And so she just said, fine, fine. You know, she, the kid wanted to she, she didn't want to be doing what the state requires right. for the basic education <laughs> of a child. And so she said to her daughter, well, then fine, we're going to meet on Sunday and we're going to talk out what it means to do horse math. And sure enough, her kid developed an entire curriculum for like the next year or two about like, well, how do you figure out how horses, how fast they run? How do you figure out how to weigh them? How, right. Everything to do with horses. Yep. I have a friend who math. <laughs> I had a friend who um, I'm not sure if they're still calling it that, but it was like it was a superhero school oh, for see, Batman. The thing. And yep. the thing is, the thing I loved about it, and it's really like that uh, that concept of andragogy is what it does is it takes your interest and then it keeps you there instead of trying to fight disinterest, which I just mm -hmm. think is you know the way to go. So um, you'll but, you'll maybe appreciate this. Um, my kids weren't reading very much, and I was an avid reader. I would devoured books. Um, my kid would just eat books, <laughs> literally <laughs> devour books. Um, but, and this was a temporary thing, but it worked. Um, first of all, we got their eyes checked with a pediatric specialist and um, the regular quick exam that they would get at Costco or Sam's club didn't catch um, another issue where my daughter's eyes would go blurry after about 20, 30 minutes of, you know, strain. And so he's like, we're just going to give her reading glasses. Like she had a little bit of a prescription for astigmatism and everything, but we're going to bring the page a little closer to her face. And um, right around that exact same time is when the pandemic hit. And I ended up putting a bookshelf in our bathroom to hold the toilet paper that I eventually, eventually got. Um, so this is a few months in. Um, we were a little running short for a minute. Um, but when we started going through the toilet paper, I started adding books 
into the spaces left behind um, at their eye level. Because when kids go to the bathroom, they don't have a phone with them. My kids don't. Right. And all of a sudden they started leaving the bathroom with the book in their hand. I'm like, wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> um but all of a sudden that was the thing like it was just magical all of a sudden my kids it was that perfect combination of just having more time at home yep. having better glasses and having the books that they might be interested in at eye level that is so smart that's a structural one that's really brilliant well on the topic of staying home and having kids um and uh working from home I am going to put in a quick little pitch to one of the things that my business partner and I committed to with this tax school. So uh, a little background. When I said that our student body is old, it's old. It's retiring. A lot of oh, them wow. are retiring. A lot of them are retiring. I actually took some time this summer and called our core student body, which was about 480 people. And uh, talked to a lot of them, left a lot of messages, talked to a lot of them. They, they're retiring. And I remember when I was doing it live and I would be so thrilled when I would see someone in their 40s and be like, oh my God, you're trying to young dude. ones. <laughs> oh, and the ongoing complaint, even in 2019, was we can't find anybody to work. And this is before COVID. And this is before, like, you can't find anyone to work for you. No, mm -hmm. it's just we can't find anyone interested in this work or available to do this work. It's very interesting. And I am, by training and inclination, literature and arts. That's, that's, my, that's my big, big background is mm -hmm. literature and arts. And I was, I was tra tracked out of math as being hopelessly uneducable in math as a child. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't great. It wasn't, it wasn't a great educational system. I didn't love it. That's sad. And yeah, it is. Um, and it, and the funny thing about the whole tax thing is the assumption that it has to do with numbers. And what I've come to find is it doesn't. And actually the tax preparers themselves will say, no, it doesn't. It's kind of a bit of a secret. It has to do with organization. The software takes care of what math there ever was, and there never was a ton of it. Bit of a surprise there. Wow. And yeah, and the software takes care of it. You're really providing, like, there's a lot of jobs anybody could do, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody can mow your lawn, but what a massive pain in the neck it is. And so you often will just hire someone to mow your lawn. Right. Taxes, taxes are the same way. They're just a pain in the neck for people to do. And businesses need a bit more than that. So if you are pretty organized, organized enough, that, that you can find things. And if you're if you're okay, like making that a thing that you're willing to do. And if you don't mind doing these, um, you know, 72 credits over three years, every single tax place needs help. And what's been really interesting is like my business partner started, fell into it because she had three young kids and needed some extra money in the year and needed it to be flexible. And so she found that she could work for you know three months and have like a giant infusion of money during those three months i used to work with circus performers who are gig workers and i keep thinking oh tax is great for them anybody who's doing care work um, oh, tax, yeah. doing taxes is great for them so we are actually going to start a program that is we haven't done before which is the sort of first level of just getting certified so that you can get the credits afterwards, like just that kind of first level. Like an introduction um, to tax preparation? I, I, it's probably a little bit more than introduction in the sense that I think I would ask people, you know, go do, go look at a couple of videos and see what it entails rather okay. than like, here's, here's, here's what it is. It would be more like getting you to the point where you could get, uh, get certified, which is a six hour course broken up and then a 100 question test. And then also some of those fall credits. And it's a very low barrier of entry. We're working on doing things like payment plans. And we're actually really working on having some of those tax preparers who are looking for staff sponsor people to just come through. Yeah, oh, that's, nice. where, that's, yeah. That's, the, that's part of the thing. But I keep looking, my thing is, and, and this is true of Cheryl, my partner, you look at these people, my nieces have had things with this. 
you look, go on Facebook and, you know, they're talking about how hard it is to sell a garage worth of leggings or some other MLM that turns out to have really been a pyramid scheme and they're kind of stuck with this, you know, bl- burgeoning bill inventory inventory and it turns out you'd have to recruit every person on the planet before you made any money back and I think it's funny that if I were to say hey have you thought about you know getting into tax prep they'd go oh no 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 I, I, I'm not that great at math and it's really interesting to sit here and be like the secret is it's you don't have to be and do they require um a certain level of education to qualify for that kind of work nope no. Do they have to have a high school education? Nope. Okay. So for everyone that's listening right now, if you don't have a high school education, you might be able to go into tax prep. Yep. And we're going to just make the distinction really quick. We're talking about the people that work for like H&R Block and some of the other places, not necessarily working for the IRS. Correct. That's correct. Yep. So uh, yeah, the IRS is hiring. They do need college educations and I think they need an accounting degree. Accounting, by the way, is different than tax prep. Some accountants do tax prep, but you don't have to be an accountant to do it. Uh, but H&R Block, yeah, you could rock up to an H&R Block and get minimum and work there and see if you like it. That's another way to do this. They also are looking for people all the time, but then you won't be working from home. Okay. So, so you can do this kind of work from home though. You absolutely can do this work at home. You can hang out a shingle on your own. Right now, judging from the feedback that I get from my students who the median age is about 60, they are so uh, eager to have people <laughs> like doing the work for with them that, that you could negotiate working from home. Okay. You know, that's not a, it's not a, it's not an impossibility. You could, you could definitely negotiate flexible work. And for people work. that are heading towards the retirement years are, is this the kind of field where people can easily find someone that would mentor or apprentice them into the industry? Yes. Yeah, that's possible. Mm-hmm. And there are groups. Uh, so the other level that people can do if they want to, this get the, the levels that we do, the education that we do, Currently, the level that we do is we serve people who are already preparing taxes. But like I said, we're starting this program for people who have never done it before. And then if you want, you can top out in this this part of the industry by becoming an EA, which is an enrolled agent. And it's someone who can go to the IRS and represent their clients in front of an audit board. But you don't have to, you don't have to be at that level if you don't want to. But all of those uh, people have many, many groups in every state for uh, mentoring and for chatting. And so, you know, some people get really into it and become real tax nerds. I, I know some mm-hmm. delightful people that I, my eyes glaze over after about 10 minutes, but I understand <laughs> that they love what they do. But then a lot of people no, it's just like, a, it's a thing they do for three months of the year, maximum four, and then they just have the flexibility to do what they want. The other parts of the year I know one guy who didn't even get an office he'd just rent an Airbnb and just (laughs) work in that for three months I mean you don't even have to though you don't have to he just liked it he just was like yeah that was his solution yeah it was it was kind of a it was kind of work at home but not your own home so you said that your business is keeping you really busy in the fall season because of um that's when you're doing your education have you ever considered becoming a tax preparer (laughs) Um, it's, I'm getting closer every year. Okay. You're like, you're almost (laughs) got me. uh, You almost got me. It's really interesting because I grew up with that sort of fear of math. I had a fear of, and and a, and a pretty tenuous grip on, you know, money, finance, even knowing about it. And because I was very much in the arts, it was kind of considered like, you know, if you're one, you're not the other. And, right. and, you know, probably in my, well, so in my forties, I ran a circus school, uh, which was pretty fun. So for, for, you know, trapeze artists, and, let's just say it's like the exact opposite of, yes, yes I know. It's so funny. And that was that from me, home. No, that was not, I had to go, I had to go there. Um, but, um, but that one, what got me sort of interested in the, in the financial side of running a business, like I, I suddenly was like, this isn't not actually math. It's, it's really like, you know, where's the money? And I also have this sense of like 
my ignorance wasn't something to be proud of. So I really dove in to kind of make up for those deficits. I do feel like Sarah Polly just said this about her Oscar win and her uh, movie, you know, go towards the things that scare you. <clears throat> and I have found that the more I know about how money works and how, and then that includes taxes. That also includes like basic accounting and stuff like that. The more comfortable you are with it, like you need it, it, it's it's business school really brought it home. This wasn't part of the curriculum. It was more like a realization that money and commerce, so not capitalism necessarily, but commerce is the lifeblood of our society right now. And you can clot that. I would suggest billionaires are blood clots in the system. <laughs> if you don't kind of have this basic understanding of your basic financial health, you won't be any, you won't be healthy. It's like not going to the doctor. So anyway, mm -hmm. all of that comes to the point that I've gotten more and more and more and more comfortable with being like, okay, okay. This is so when we do run this introductory course, I actually will pay attention and, and take it. Whereas in the past, we've been running these courses for people who have been doing this for a long time. And I've been like, higher level I don't have to listen to anything yeah. for the next hour <laughs> so yeah nothing to hook it on to no no you know yeah so I'm curious what kind of um population are you seeing that might be interested in this line of work the people that um are leaving the industry because of aging out um who are they being replaced with well they're not that's the problem okay yeah it's just a it's a it's a gaping hole is what it is can it be uh, lucrative enough that people might want to go into it or as a stepping stone to get into say accounting or business school or working with the irs you wouldn't go into accounting from here probably uh you could but you probably wouldn't it, it, it's, it was interesting because i didn't realize they were so detached tax prep is tax prep accounting is accounting if you want to get into accounting go ahead if you want to then take some tax prep wouldn't hurt you but the okay. other way is not necessarily true and uh, people seem to get into it because their families were doing it. That's a big one. Mm. And uh, because the, the younger ones that I have seen uh, often have little kids. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're women with kids and want the flexibility. I mean, it really is nice. Actually, uh, the woman who did my taxes uh, for the past couple of years it, it went into the business because her father was retiring. But she has little kids and she just doesn't work the rest of the year. Okay. So it, it can be, it depends what you decide you're interested in. Like, that's the other thing. And that's true with a lot of these things. What you, wh where it leads you is going to make a difference. So if you were doing basic tax returns for individuals, you'd do great. And you'd have a, a charge in your, like, like I said, for like the uh, circus performers who have, have gig work, it's perfect because I mean, like influx of money at this time that you're probably not touring. I know. I know the children's entertainment industry um, that for depending on what part of the country you live in, this is also a slow season because of winter. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, Easter gets kind of busy, um, which might conflict, but I can see some of these gig workers, like you said, um, benefiting. Yeah. And but I don't think that flexible. any of them, I, I can't imagine a single one of them has ever considered tax preparation. And that's where, that's where my little kind of pitch comes in is, is think about it and try it and bail if you don't like it because the barrier to entry is low and the opportunity is huge. If you decided you really liked it, you could focus on business tax returns. Those are quite lucrative. You More could definitely, money. Yeah. You could definitely make a year's worth of decent employment doing just business you know no is that going to be a year-round thing though no nope, that would quarterly well, there might it's up to you do you want to take on people that want that do the quarterly or do you know what i mean it's up to you mm -hmm. you decide what you want to do uh one of the most interesting things i thought i found was anybody that gets into this and then decides they're very interested in trusts and estates uh, can pretty much write their own check from here on out for, the, for, you know, the next decade anyway. And again, this does not require any specific level of education. No, you would just get into the being certified and then you would uh, take the courses on trust and estates. And then you would find like, you would 
it's a certain amount of this would be self-education and experience. You'd, mm-hmm. you'd look for mentors that do this, and then you would try to work on that kind of tax return as much as possible till you, I would say, I would say you could probably, so usually the first year of any job, but the first year of this job is really getting used to it. The mm-hmm. second job is getting, the second year is getting proficient. Third job, you're really rolling, third year, sorry, third year, you're really rolling. Mm-hmm. So in this particular case, if you decided that you wanted to specialize in trusts and estates and you looked into it, you didn't mind the legalese because there's a lot of legalese. So in the last in the last 20 years and continuing on today, elderly parents, in particular now boomers, have been told by their financial advisors to put their assets into trusts and estates so that their kids can inherit with fewer penalties. Hmm. What that means that tax preparers have to know at least the basics. If you decide you want to really understand tax and estates, then you could become a specialist and a consultant and name your price because everyone is looking for someone to come in and either train their staff to do trusts and estates or assist their staff to do trusts and estates or just do all the trusts and estates people are desperate and i've heard that nonstop for the last uh, the, the whole i've been in, involved in this now for four years and the whole time i've been getting emails saying do you know anyone can you hook me up with anyone and oh that's goodness. the other that's the other piece of what we're doing we're going to start a subscription list of of um match doing job matching you know we we have all these educated students once we get the program mm-hmm. running and then who are all these people that need to um, another question. So if it doesn't require a high school diploma, can a 16 year old start this work? No, you have to be an adult. You okay. have to be 18 because you have to register with the IRS and get a preparer's uh, ID number, which is called a P10. I forget what uh, tax <laughs> preparer's mm-hmm. tax ID number. Um, yeah. And But and, if you're 18 years old and you're still in high school, yeah, you could do oh, this yeah. work. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which is a pretty neat thought too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to say there is no, there is, mm, this is so funny. This has to do with that whole math educate self-education thing I had to do. There is no downside to learning as much as you can about how money works, Mm -hmm. how taxes work, how money works, how any of this works. There is no downside to it. Um, And so, yeah, you you can do it that way. And I will let you know, even though it is a different program than ours, and this is something teens can do. uh, Well, again, 18. um, I might have to look it up and put it in your show notes, whether it's 16 or 18. Okay. I know it's 18. I'm not sure if they take anybody younger. There is a program called VISTA, V-I-S-T-A. That is an IRS federal program. Volunteer uh, income volunteer anyway i can't remember all of what it, the, uh, the it's an acronym loves, the government loves its acronyms mm-hmm. yeah so that program is uh a more basic one than the one we are running uh at my school but it is effectively the same kind of thing and what those people do is go through the training and join a volunteer corps that help out low income disabled and senior taxpayers to fill out their taxes and i'm trying to look it up i see vita but you said it's vista oh it's vita yep volunteer income tax assistance thank you you're faster at looking it up and that was a brain blip on my part yes vita not vista um so that helps people that might not have the means to pay a preparer to stay compliant year by year yeah exactly um does it have a does it say the age uh, i haven't looked up that part yet <laughs> <laughs> i can try to see uh, age it, it may end up saying 65 and older for the yeah really is for 50 years stuff. and older so um yeah i don't know i don't know what the age to work in the program would be but so that would be I, something to look into i found out about all of this because i was cold calling all of those uh, teachers and mm-hmm. one of them said that she uh, has high schoolers and and she also teaches community college, but she had a whole team of kids doing this and and I just don't know whether she had to only use the older seniors or whether they could do this with her a little bit earlier. But I'll find out and send you that 
for the show notes. This is really interesting. So for homeschooling families um, or for families um, with teenagers who are choosing not to go straight into college, um, if you want to have a lucrative job, possibly, and still have freedom to travel in uh, other months, this would be something interesting to step into. Yep. And it also really for anybody uh, that wants to get volunteer credits or wants to do volunteering, this is also a really nice the Vita. Really nice pro- program, Vita. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the deal is you could try it. Out, th- and this is what I say about H&R Block and the rest of them. The barrier to entry for this is <laughs> like make up, you know, MLMs and people are like, well, I have to put in, you know, 15,000 before you can start. Here, the barrier is very, very low. It's a little bit of time. If you took our introductory course, it's $425. Once we get it going to have some people um, sort of to have employers subsidize it, that will go down. Or you can do Vita and Vita is free. And you can try this out. And if you try this out for a tax season or two and you say, wow, uh, this is something I do not like. Mm -hmm. Nope harm no foul you really haven't you have all you've learned is how the system that like a major system of the blood running through our country works and maybe you'll be more equipped to do your own taxes you absolutely will which means you're saving money yeah Um, but um and then if you do decide you like it then you are walking into a field that has been absolutely stripped of people over the last couple of years. I interviewed a gentleman recently who is in the cybersecurity space mm, and yep. because that's a growing, growing field, they are at what he called negative. How do you say it? How do you say it when um, there's not enough employees to meet like the need deficit somehow? Yeah. Yeah. It's like unemployment, but it's like negative unemployment. So like they, they need more people than they can get. Yep. And it sounds like the tax preparation field is in a similar boat. It is. And it's a Venn diagram because we actually overlap on cybersecurity because there is some what? parts. <laughs> yeah. There's some parts about using a use for, you know, setting up systems so that the computer that you use for people, like there's a whole ethical thing about it when you, when you're putting together people's tax returns, that you are using a computer that is not used for other things. Okay. And that you, you know, uh, some dedicated kinds of ways of keeping people's, you know, information private. Right. So that, maybe not is... using the library free Wi-Fi. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're you can have... do that for your part of the job, but they might not be able to do that for tax preparation. That's absolutely correct. And and there's classes on that. There's mandatory. You have to take two credits of ethics, I think, every year. Okay. Or maybe it's every other year. So there's there's some there's some built in making sure that that's the case. It's not. It's not like a again it's not like you have to go out and buy seventy thousand dollars worth of cybersecurity equipment but rather how are you setting up your files to make sure that they can't be accessed by mm-hmm. you know people that would steal identities that you that you are there is a seriousness to the work in that you are dealing with people's identities and their social security numbers so right you know but but again there's tons of people that can and we always have a cybersecurity class, but there's tons of people that can come out and say, okay, here's how you do this. And here's how you do that. I'm looking at my wall because I interviewed a guy. My episode 16 was with Dan Wheeler, who now is not quite my neighbor, but he lives in the same city as I do. Um, he is the work from home email security guy. Ah, and in that episode, we talked a lot. And if anybody is interested, I would go back and listen to that. And then also my cybersecurity guy that I interviewed more recently. I can't remember that episode because I don't have it on my wall. Um, but both of those would really help give people an idea of like what kind of setup you might want to have. But it sounds like you could walk into a local tax preparer and say, hey, I want to apprentice with you. Can I help yeah. you? Would you be willing to cover my $400 for my class? That might be a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do it. Yep. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's exciting because I do have a lot of people that come to me and say, you know, can I get a job like you have? And some of the industries that I worked in required a bachelor's degree, required yeah, a lot it. Of, a lot of them do. And this yeah. one sounds, and so I, and I like, you know, with the soaring cost of education and the debt that people are, you know, we're still paying for our three master's degrees. And so I'm looking at my kids and I'm like, listen, 
you're going to mm-hmm. twist balloons to put yourself through college. Yep. <laughs> um, but now you, you know, my son, he, I'm like, Hey, listen, cybersecurity where is where it's at, you know? Um, yeah. and I want them to go to college, but I want them to be able to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, community college helps too. Although I have yes. to say my local community college dropped their accounting program, but I think they just didn't have enough people interested. And again, having had, uh, you know, math teacher trauma, I think it's really easy to have mm-hmm. kids very discouraged and think and think that a certain course of action, I think everybody assumes that doing your taxes is a lot of math. Oh yeah. And then they're looking at, well, what other um, industries require math that pay better? Right. right. And so I can see why there might be a deficit. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I think that, um, you know, I look at other countries, this is, <laughs> I'm going to go a little off book uh, in terms of my, you know, self-interest here. I look at other countries where the government already knows how much money you have because your employer told them and your bank told them, uh-huh. and, like everyone's already told them. So a lot of countries, you just get a statement and then you correct it. And, and if it looks correct, that's your taxes. Wow. But, but the United States has not done that because that is not how we kind of kludge together our system people want so to pretend that they have a, a transparent or no that that they have um privacy yeah and they want to do a little bit and this is this reminds me of ireland a bit they want to do just a little bit of like a wink can i get a can i like not do this one can i can i you know deduct my shoes you know oh, kind of things. Right. you know they would want to kind of do a little bit of a thing around it but the fact is that's not going to change anytime soon and liberty tax is huge h&r block is huge they're not going to change anytime soon so for the foreseeable future this is a good thing to go into Mm-hmm. And yes, you can absolutely rock up. I would rock up to a local uh, practitioner who is not a big corporation, but mm-hmm. if you do go to the corporations, they will actually give you the training too. But, but you could make four times as much out of the back of your car. So, okay. You know, I wonder if they make you sound like a no compete. I don't know that they do. I haven't really gone through their stuff. Actually, we have people who, who are like, oh, I can't get that stuff from here. And they, they'll come to us. So I, we do have some people from those big, um, big companies that just take our classes because they like the way they're taught and they need the credits anyway. But um, yeah, I don't I don't really know. They might also they might want you to have a an educational background. That okay, turn out turn out not to need. And again, it feels like one of those like, um, there's a TikTok where some, somebody says, what's something about your job that feels illegal to know? That's one of those things where you're like, well, if you looked at H&R Block and they said you needed a BA, in, preferably in accounting, then you would say, especially women would go, ah, I don't have that. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. And if you looked at taxes and you thought, oh, I was always so bad at math and you wouldn't do it. And the fact is it's, it, it doesn't and it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah surprise surprise <laughs> so you talked about the software does the math i tried to do my own taxes using like the h and block website years ago and then at that point we i was like paying to three different states because of the way my job was and we my husband was a student and we had three kids and we had a house rental um that we were renting um and a few other complicated things and it was just too much for the software yep. and i had to go ahead and switch to a cpa yeah. Um, well, do these people have a more robust software than I had? Not necessarily. Some of them use the IRS. I believe there's a free IRS software actually. Oh, as well. okay. yeah. Yeah. I, it really comes down to sometimes mowing your lawn is just too much. Yeah. And you're like, it's just, it's just the, you know, amount of maple leaves in my yard, please just take it somebody from me. Come over and, <laughs> somebody come over and do it. It's not, it's not what I'm interested in doing. However, all right, here's a funny parallel. I used to be a nanny. Me too. And, ah, <laughs> and I, I thought long and hard about what it's like to uh, be a parent for money. And I read an essay by um, Richard Dreyfus's personal assistant. And she talked about how one morning Richard Dreyfus lost his wallet. And she just like spent the day tracking down where he could have put his wallet and right around the same time her husband lost his wallet and she was like you fool find your damn wallet (laughs) you find your own wallet (laughs) and she said at that moment she realized 
like it makes a difference whether you're making a paycheck for doing this incredibly annoying thing. So if you're <laughs> if you're out there mowing somebody's lawns and you're making some money for it, you're making, you know, 100 bucks for doing the lawn, you feel real differently about it than when you do your own. <laughs> oh, I have a very real life. I haven't mentioned this on the show yet, but my um we have someone in our neighborhood who has an Airbnb. Um, technically the HOA doesn't like that, but technically, um, there's a few loops that he can get through and, and make it happen. Um, you know, length of lease is arbitrary apparently right now. Um, and so I've been cleaning this house for these people and I do not mind cleaning the house <laughs> right? because right. For, for one thing, one thing is clean. Like it's already like every, everybody has taken all their stuff off of every counter, every service. All I have to do is basically wash some clothes and clean surfaces. Right. Um, I, I have to make the beds, you know, and the towels, um, cleaning my house is very different. But money is a way of showing value and it's legit. And so that is the thing, you know, so maybe, maybe it is a thing where it's such a trudge to, you know, even get through the software, but if someone's giving you $135 an hour to do it, you may feel very differently. See, that's the first time you've said a figure. So it is. in it three is. months, and the only reason I say that is because I just paid a guy $130 mm. an hour, $135 an hour, because mine, uh, the woman who is doing mine has, has uh, changed her practice to be business, business taxes only. only. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Which and is I wonder how country. much she is charging per hour for her services. I'm not sure now. Um, it was, it was around 130, but she also, she does have a degree in accounting. She did. Mm -hmm. do, so, you know, I kind of fell into, I actually had her father as my, as my tax guy for a couple of years. So, you know, these people have a different background. I didn't shop around a lot. I just was like, take it. And then this year yep. I thought I'd forgotten that she was out of the business. And I, I actually said to her, do you want some help? help and then like I would, and she was like no I can't do that this year and I was like <gasps> so I called somebody emergency and had them do it which means I probably paid more than I had to um but I don't know what the prevailing um amount is this guy charges 135 an hour but I don't think it's that I mean I think I think I would pay that at H&R Block and I think the preparer would get 18. Ah what you know which is what I meant about making a lot more out of the back of your car. So, okay. Yeah. So if you have your own business, you can keep the, yeah. the yeah. Rate. Or, or if you work with, you know, one of these people who's getting on and you're just like, and, and actually that's another thing. Um, this, this came up at the conference where people were saying, uh, you know, all these, all these people retiring want to sell their businesses, but nobody wants to buy them. However, what that means for a regular, you know, person getting into it is to is to say well I don't I'm not, I don't have the funds to buy this thing but I'll tell you what I could work out a flexible thing with you where I gradually take it over a percentage at a time and then continue to pay you as a you know as an owner as an investor something back for the and then at the end of whatever agreed upon time five years seven years I own the business but rent I to own kind of rent, thing rent to own exactly that there's and and the thing is once you're talking this once you're talking like this guy that I found was <laughs> in town once you're talking about that you are talking about people who they're going to weigh out a negotiation of this is this could work for me like oh I really wanted, I wanted someone to come and buy it from me for $200,000, but mm -hmm. no one is interested. Oh, oh, so the value of their, um, Beanie Babies collection, they're yeah. realizing isn't maybe what they thought it would be. Yeah. Or that you, you just, you know, it's more than that in that millennials do not have ready cash to buy a tax business. And oh, right. So when you have somebody who says, my God, I could work this out where, like maybe uh, this is what my business partner did uh, after that first year, she was just able to hire like adjunct childcare for those three months of the year, but not for the rest right. of the year. She didn't have uh -huh. to anymore. So, Temporary nanny. Yeah. So being able to do something like that and then ultimately find yourself owning a business that's flexible. I mean, that's a way to go. And it's a, it's a perfectly viable. And, and now you're talking about between people. Now you're talking about somebody who does want to bail and go to Florida and might be a little more interested in not getting a cash payment of 200,000 because nobody's got that, but they do have willingness schedules, want to work from home, want to be with the kids. 
those kinds of things. So yeah. This yeah. would almost be like an ideal snowbird's job though. Like people that travel south for the winter and rent a place and just work from January through March. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. It could be. Although at least with my crew, uh, with my student body, they've, they've been doing it a long time and they really want to retire. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> you know, they're, they're kind of, if this is one of the weird economic things that's happened over the last 40 years is that um, the wealth accumulation conditions were wrong for anyone to kind of organically come up and take over for the next okay. thing unless unless they have a kid who wants to take the business so and question oh go ahead finish know. yeah oh just just that nobody seems to know that it is well within a regular person's reach okay so now i've lost it oh, <laughs> oh no <laughs> this happens like every episode i swear we'll just pause for a long a long I moment i think one here. of the things that's interesting for me as coming from the arts and from co coming from sort of these um more creative sides of things was the i the idea that i was somehow ineligible or that these things would be too boring to be interesting and i did not realize as a younger person that it is like delightful to have a reliable source of income that untethers you from a really boring job all the time that that like oh. yeah a bit of boring or a bit of something I'm not fully passionate about can fund the rest of my life I actually had a great talk with someone who's going to take this introductory course this summer he is a mentor and an organizer at an um at a nonprofit that creates it's so weird it's it's wild they get these kids from uh at risk high risk areas and they have a house in this town that has a really good high school and they basically create a boarding school to the public school where the kids board at this house that has house parents and mentors and tutors so they come from these really um impoverished areas they apply for this program then they live in this house and then they go to the local but very highly regarded public school okay. it's a really interesting thing but does it pay well no it does not but can he get another 40 hour a week job no so his passion is doing this stuff for these kids could he do uh every weekend all spring long you know for those four three three and a half four months three months really right so, uh january february march april so three and a half months could he double down and do like evenings and weekends during that time and get a ton of cash that supports his nonprofit habit yes and that's what he's going to do because that will enable him to do the job he loves that is so spiritually rewarding but not financially rewarding and i was like correct <laughs> like yeah can you see yourself doing this job? That yeah, maybe taxes isn't like the most thing you're passionate about, but does it let you do the thing you are passionate about? Yeah. <laughs> I could see it even working well for the people who consider themselves to be digital nomads, as long as they can have a secure uh, internet connection and, you know, safe, you know, practices in that way. Um, and then even if they ended up at their home base for those yep. four months, that would give them the freedom to travel the other months and maybe just do a little freelancing on the side. Um, I did think of my question. Yes. So I come from a history of having, I worked for um, Mayo Clinic for many years as a medical transcriptionist and technology changes basically got me out of my job. Um, they ended up outsourcing a bunch, but really it was the voice recognition technology that kind of got me out. Um, you know, advances in, in the technology, you know, over the years we were using it, but eventually they're like, yeah, we don't really need you anymore. And I wonder if people wonder, I wonder if people wonder if, um, now that there's all the software, if there just isn't as much of a need or that people can just do their own. Well, that's going to be the thing. And that's why I keep uh, saying that it's like doing your lawn. And yep. for one thing, for one thing, uh, businesses, small businesses, and I'm talking, you know, people who are doing great but they only have you know for example a restaurant doesn't always have a fully dedicated accountant who wants to do their taxes right they have access to a bookkeeper mm -hmm. but maybe you know it's that kind of thing um or you just don't like doing it or your life is just too busy to climb that particular uh, learning curve which okay. it is i mean that's mm -hmm. why we have these programs 
And I think the other thing is, is the investment in that AI software. So I could see, I could, see, so that you can, in fact, do your own taxes for free. Now you can just, you can fill out a 1040 easy with a crayon if you want, or you can go online and do it electronically. <laughs> like crayon. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can, one can, it is possible, but people don't really like to, you know, and, um, and I do think their technology will change it. And, and, and I think that what will happen, I would guess, because this is kind of the way it always goes, is that the huge places like Liberty Tax and, and H&R Block would implement those AI, if not systems, assists, assuming that the IRS was okay with them, which actually would take a long time to be okay with them. But assuming that it does that, they're still going to charge $135. They're not going to drop their price because they're using AI. <laughs> they'll just do so, more yeah so now you have the potential if you wanted to get 100 bucks an hour instead of 135 dollars an hour and just work on it like there's there's still an area of competitiveness and like i said i mean i i think this is my forecast is that this will be the same for at least the next 10 years okay what happens after that i'm not sure I'll right see as it unfolds yeah but. So maybe not the longest term plan, but possibly because taxes don't ever go away. They've been around for thousands and thousands of years. They do not go away. <laughs> and if you decided <laughs> you loved it and your kids were a little older and you said, you know what, the heck with it. I am going to go over to my community college or go online and get an accounting degree and go into accounting and do more of that. I mean, the IRS is hiring like 186,000 people to get through their backlog. I know they just have, and there still are, um, yeah. cause they're just so swamped too, right? They're so swamped. And the, you know, there, there was somebody in the white house that sort of put the stop on any doing of, of like reviewing of taxes and, and all that kind of thing. It's just, it, yeah. Yeah. There's just a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of slowdowns in weird areas that, um, have so now we're it trying to play catch up and maybe the accountant people are going to the IRS and that leaves even a bigger void for the tax preparers. Yeah. That's, tax entirely, preparers. that's entirely possible. If they thought that that would be a good career move, all the, uh, all the IRS and department of revenue people that I like the state revenue people I know all started as tax practitioners in some way or another, whether they were um, accountants who did it on the side or started there and then got an accountancy thing. You know, I figured out an even better, an even better metaphor than the lawn. You actually can plan and implement your entire funeral, but almost nobody wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to use that one. That's amazing. <laughs> right. De death and taxes. Is always, is That's always the two that taxes. you can't get rid of. <laughs> those are the two. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So, um, so yeah, so on this side of the year, I do some coaching. I wrote a book on being a good boss, but I also try to get people into work that they love. Like I try to do this kind of thing. I love, I love when people are able to fund like their nonprofit mentorship habit with something that got them there. I, I look at the tax thing. It's one of the reasons why, you know, it's so fun to talk to my business partner, Cheryl, because I never would have looked at, I never would have looked at, at, um, at doing taxes. And instead I did like kludgy together. Uh, you know, I, I was a nanny, but I also cleaned houses. I also cleaned offices. We have I so also... much in common. <laughs> there we go. I think you, you know, had a little stint in like typing and stuff too, yeah, right? Yeah. I did some transcription that was a little more recent, but I did some of that back then. Like I just tried to get to get anything that I could together in order to have the flexibility. And I, I remember doing piecework at one point. I was like, maybe if I sewed these little things that the oh, wow. wanted, like, and I was like my own little sweatshop and the kitchen table. And I thought, this is awful. Like I, you're trying to this, homeschool your kids by this doing what, these. This is, yeah. This is when they were younger, even than that, when they were babies and I was really trying. And I'm like, now I'm like, I wish I had known. And I would look up like how to do remote work how to do flexible work around kids. And they were oh, always yeah. go to your boss and put in a request. Oh, right. I know. That my mom like, said she tried to like stuff envelopes, envelopes back in the eighties. And it I was like for that. 15 cents an yep. hour or something yep. crazy. That was a, that was a job that I recognized when I, when I go on Facebook and I see these um, friends of mine, actually one of them is a teacher and she's always looking for extra income. And, and I'm like, I I've been there. And if I had known that I could just do this in the spring, 
and that I was capable of doing it and that I was, I, you know, as a parent, I didn't start organized, but after a couple of years, I absolutely was. Um, and the gig workers I know, as they do more of that, they become very organized at like their mm -hmm. contracts and their, you know, the mm -hmm. getting, making sure that their um, receipts and everything are in order. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's just like, you're there. You're, you've got the bar. You're okay. You don't, you don't need to be more than what you are to do this. And, and like, you this are a, a woman who basically failed math as a child. And now you're considering tax preparation. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. And it's funny because if there's one thing my MBA taught me, it's, it's that any idiot can run a company and many of them do. And we hear about it nonstop, but in between are all these people who actually aren't idiots, but have said, Oh, no, that seems like too much for me. And, and it turns out it, it isn't. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where, where it, it's open to people. It's a weird one that's open to people. And I don't think maybe when my kids were younger, I think there wasn't the uh, critical need that there is now. I mean, people, like, like I said, I had to find a new one, like, <laughs> like a yikes kind of on the fly <laughs> on the fly yeah and just like call people and be like I hope you're good um, and you're pretty well connected in that I'm world pretty well connected but I don't have a lot that are near me okay um and uh and had availability and answered the phone and stuff like that so you know yeah um so the the need is a lot more critical now than it was before and and just the amount of people that are aging out it's and COVID COVID put the you know jet fuel on that because a lot of them were like oh never mind that <laughs> i'm really done now okay yeah so like a quick a lot of retirement a lot of retirement yeah. janet we haven't we've barely talked about your home setup um oh, i know you have a dog i do and i think you're working in a attic i am yes right now i'm working in an attic because this is a podcast and it's nice to keep my uh environment quiet i actually for my I love this house. I have a house sitting gig where I do pay rent, but it is uh, lower because I take care of the garden and the house and all the stuff. For some where you are now? Abroad. Yeah. So I have this beautiful house and it's got a porch and it's got a deck. I've never been happier at work. Um, I was in a very tiny apartment two years ago, like minuscule working from home, which is why I said I would go out to the library and sit on the patio there. But the way it is now for the work that I do for myself, like the work that I do, that's not um, for the public's not involved. So when I have to set up the um, uh, when I have to set up the website, when I have to um, set up all the applying to the IRS, all those kinds of things. In the mornings, I work out on the deck and then the sun gets hot and I grab my stuff and I go out to the porch and I go sit there and little dog gate. It's perfect. Um, and then when I'm running classes, uh, I can do that from the living room because I'm not presenting. So what I'm doing is going like this, you know, when they say, and Janet's here, if you have any questions, just type it in the chat. That's mm -hmm. me. And I might turn on and say, hi. Um, and that's it. So I don't have to depend on the sound quality that I do for things like podcasting. So for that, I can just do it in my living room. I did make myself a little counterweighted screen thing that I can put up and down so I can stand if I want to. Um, and then my podcast, uh, I would always come up here to this attic, which has some, a um, uh, little bit of soundproofing here. It's got a big foam thing back there that's soundproofing. And today you have extra soundproofing on the roof. And today, yeah, today I have about 10 inches of extra soundproofing on the roof. I'm actually, I haven't heard it yet, but if it gets any warmer, it'll avalanche down all that snow will just slide yeah. off <laughs> but, 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 and you'll I'll know because the dog will just jump up and run in here and be a little upset because she, she thinks she, she thinks she's at the bottom of a, of a and you somewhere. said that you were also working from home with kids so sometimes it was kind of hodgepodge while you're homeschooling but now yeah now um so my kids are all grown up it's lovely on this side. Uh, and my 28 year old lives nearby. So for COVID, which co coincided with that COVID year that I was still at the university, but we put the program online. I was in that very tiny apartment and my daughter, my 28 year old daughter was there. Um, she, uh, it, we just had to work out like 
quiet times we had to work out like well both of us do asl so sometimes we would, i would just if i was on i would put the camera and i just sign to her oh my goodness the yeah. sign language that's yeah. brilliant yeah it has so many uses in regular <laughs> life um so yeah and then when they were younger you know once i got into that um concept of uh, child-led and interest like interest generated homeschooling mm -hmm. I did work a lot I worked for a publisher at that point so it's more than 10 years in the sense of it all being sort of non-linear but um, I worked for a publisher and a lot of my work was from home he had set up a way to do that anywhere with servers and stuff and having like all of us sitting at the table doing work really well I could sit there and, and create ads I would often say I'd often put out a big clock and be like the time for questions at the top of the hour uh let, let's have you repeat that because it went really quiet what would you put up a big sure. clock a, a big clock yeah start and start I, that part over I would so, put up so when I when I used to do what I think of as like round table work when my kids were homeschooled school age and I was working for this uh publisher I worked I did a compositing of ads for his newspaper but I also did a lot of copy editing on books and that could happen anywhere I would go to the office every once in a while but I could do it from anywhere and when we did these round table kind of things with the kids having their work to do we would talk for five minutes about what kind of work we had to do and it basically like focus mate what kind of work we were going to do in the next hour and questions are at the top of the hour so if you have to talk to me, unless you're passing out or something like that, or there's like, something's on fire and I don't see it. <laughs> I can't imagine my kids abiding by this, but continue. It, it worked okay because we were all at the same place. And because my kids were like, you know, it depends the ages, but, you know, um, uh, that we'll talk about, we'll talk about your questions at the end of the hour, basically. And we'll all, we'll all just work here for an hour and we'll have a, we'll have a check-in at the end of the hour. And I could get an hour, well, 50 minutes anyway of an hour banged out pretty well over the course like a couple times of a day and and be able to get stuff yeah. done did I do most of it when they were asleep yeah but um you know I'd stay up late and I do stuff and of course the publishing um the publishing like pressure time is a wave so like in the case of doing things like copy editing for a magazine, you only do that at certain times. So you're not up at, you're not up at one o'clock every single night. You're up till one o'clock for three nights in a row. And then that doesn't happen again until next month or the month after, okay. you know, sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, so that was never, that, that didn't have that kind of demand um, that a nine to five on nine to five time. Yeah. Happens. So I used it's to like work out bursts stuff like that. Bursts. of activity. And I try to, I try to make it work with like, can we all be just doing something? I don't care if it's coloring. I don't care if you're, you know, writing something. I don't care if you have headphones in. Um, when they were teens, I would have them watch TED Talks and then write a five paragraph essay. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So you can do that. Um, one of my daughters used to love making extensive quizzes for her little sister. My middle daughter would make these quizzes for her little sister in ways that my daughter, my youngest daughter wouldn't take that kind of thing from me, but she thought this was hilarious from her sister. So I was like, yeah. great. So we'll, you guys quiz thing. And I'm just going to be working here. I mean, I'm still available. <laughs> the house is on fire. I love that. I, I can't, I can't pull myself out of this every minute. So just in an hour when that dings, we'll mm -hmm. all like, and, and, and I, I'd, I'd often tell them, you know, either write down a question or draw a picture of your question so that we can have it afterwards. So like it's that. kind of like an extended Pomodoro method, like a 50 minute kind yeah. of like we do with Fo focus mate, you and I met there. Yes. Um, my daughter has started doing them with me, like not necessarily an actual focus mate session on the video, but we'll be like, let's do one together. Just you and me yeah. in real life. Well, it's and like it works. Co it's like it's like a co-working or body double but it's also kind of like what worked for me in when I was working in offices or in businesses which is I'm really busy trying to get together like this whole uh you know social media thing I I, I will be available for questions at two uh -huh. put it on slack like okay. I'm 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 ankle deep in this thing right um, <laughs> do not disturb <laughs> do, do not disturb but like the top of the hour i'll, I'll absolutely look in okay. on this or something like that so I, you know that it was kind of like that and um yeah. and it, and 
and I always think about how before the advent of the, you know, it's funny. I, I have a love hate relationship with schools, as you can tell. Um, you know, uh, school public schooling is excellent. I think it's I think it's necessary. I think it's critical. I also think that it's based on a factory. And that that is not good. I, like, in other words, I think there's a lot of legitimate critiques to how we have decided to set up our public schools. Yeah. And before that, you worked. You worked in a printing press and your kids were around. And, you know, so I often was yeah. like, okay, well, so how do we integrate the work I have to do with the basic level of education that the state requires mm-hmm. <laughs> that you guys get? Um, right. So It's interesting. Um homeschooling opens up a lot of flexibility, but, um, I, I also have kind of enjoyed the benefits of living in a more metropolitan area. Now I grew up in a small, small town. There was one elementary school. Um, but right now we have choices. And so we can choose where we want our kids to go. And right now they're at a project-based learning, um, (gasps) school. And so like their, um, materials list at the beginning of the year, wasn't like six notebooks and five folders it was like bring duct tape uh hot glue gun sticks protective gloves and goggles and I was like okay Uh, (laughs) and they learned the standards they learned the math and the social studies and so it's cool a charter school opened up when my two youngest were getting into like middle school times and they ended up electing to go there and it was the same kind of thing and and my kids tried out school whenever they wanted to was basically the thing but the other thing that that it was a real realization about homeschooling is that um, if your child is ever injured, um, and I went to school, one of my best friends had uh, scoliosis and had to have major back surgery as a kid. Mm. And the amount of time that the town or state or whatever the, the district will send a tutor for is two hours a day. That's the estimated on task learning time mm-hmm. of a student in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which uh-huh. means that. Uh-huh. How, how long am I really asking them to go and find something to, you know, go build oh, yeah. Legos while I do the layout on this thing? So it, to some extent, you know, the on task time they had to do could kind of work with how much work I had to do. And then the rest is go play, which is your job anyway, kids. Absolutely. You know, and I'll bring my and I'll bring my laptop out to the backyard. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, my kids were, you know, are cooking noodles on the stove. I'll be working at the kitchen table more often than not lately. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go be and bored. It's not, and it's not, right. And it's not ideal and everything falls apart and then everything kind of comes back to get, talk about waves. Everything comes back together and everything <laughs> falls apart again. And I would get up at 3 a.m. and like an anxiety sweat thinking, oh, I'm ruining everybody's lives. But they're now 30 and 28 and 25 and they're all fine. Like, I wish I could get that sleep back they're fine mm-hmm. <laughs> so, all three of them they didn't have to but they did go to college they graduated one of them has gotten part of a master's degree I mean they're all you know okay <laughs> so, sounds good you know, sounds good that is, to some extent and then it becomes it's funny um I saw a wonderful therapist in Dublin Tony Monahan. if anyone ever needs a therapist in Dublin center wonderful man and he said when you talk about like how you liked the life that homeschooling like turned out to be try to try to make your work life look like that that seems to be like what you like and oh wow like, yeah so working at home putting my stuff on the back deck and then moving it to the porch mm-hmm. flexibility yeah. seasons and bursts yep and uh um making my own money instead of making it for someone who really needs to go see a therapist of their own Mm. that's a big one mm-hmm. and the autonomy right the, yep. the autonomy to be able to say well in fact I did work for four days for like 10 hour days so I'm not working for the next three days that's fine I know what work needs to be done and what doesn't so right you know and on this side of the year like I said more more consulting I have a book that I wrote but I have to edit um I have a book on Amazon I'll send you the link that's was called- that the one about a boss yeah, it's, it's a bad bosses. It's called why they hate you a little book for bosses. And it's a fake children's book that just is about being a terrible boss and how to not be one. And that one's already out right now. That one's out. Yeah. Which yeah. is the one that's coming. The one that's coming. <laughs> I've said that for a year now, cause I have to go through the editing is, um, is nominally called the care and feeding of your nonprofit, which is just like a, so many people 
that I've worked with call their nonprofits their baby. And I was like, okay, then let's write a baby book for how to start a nonprofit. So, and how to, and how to keep it healthy, right? Basically a baby book. Okay. Um, instruction manual kind of I thing. I see a theme here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know that. I know that world. And it's not that different, quite honestly. It's all about <laughs> relation. It's all about relationships. And, and, you know, we could, we could dissect a uh, um, certain billionaires right now and their failure to be able to make human relationships and how bad it is for your business when you can't do that. <laughs> but we wouldn't not... ever name names. No, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so, and I'd like to make that one a series. I, I want to, I want to adjust it and have, you know, a version of the care and feeding of your family business or the care and feeding of your small business. Care and feeding. I was hearing Karen. Oh, <laughs> care and feeding okay care um, and feeding. it may not be the right title too my editor was like I don't like this title and I'm like, okay think of Work. another baby book title that a I working title I can't do what to expect when you're expecting mm, a nonprofit. Mm, I can't right. do <laughs> you know what about that summer course you said is coming is there a launch yes. date for that or is it kind there of is still a, there is a launch date for that and it is um I want to say uh, August, uh, July 1st, August 1st. It's one of those. Uh, so I've said yes. And then I have completely flubbed your question. Um, <laughs> Daryl and I got as far as like preliminary scheduling for it. I know I have to tell the IRS what we're doing by June 1st. Okay. Um, so sometime yeah. this summer coming near, coming to yeah. a, a web browser yeah. near you, something yeah, and, and it'll be midsummer and it'll be um, uh, M is in Massachusetts, T is in tax, S is in school, F is in four, P is in practitioners, mtsfp.com. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have stuff on the website. I'll have a little thing up there. Um, I think I might now that says we're, we're starting with this and um, putting it in place and getting IRS certification on it. And then we'll put up our registration for it. Um, yeah. And so questions can email me too. So I'll have you give your contact information at the very end. Before that, give me one more question yeah. or I will ask you to answer one more question. Um, I usually just ask, and this is an interesting one for you because you um, have a little bit more insight for people that, you know, don't necessarily have the same education as some jobs that require. What is your advice for people who want to work from home for the first time? Um. Everything I do, I, my first impulse was to call it stabbing in the dark, but I've actually heard it called officially uh, wayfinding is the nicer, gentler, sweeter way of saying it. And so I have late diagnosed ADHD. And so I've become a lot more forgiving now that I know that this was actually my brain thinking things out instead of what I thought it was at the time, which is never getting anything right. Mm. Instead, it is there is no right until you settle on the right. So start, um, you know, head for the things that scare you, but start. And in those places you feel uncomfortable, try something else. This isn't it, right? This is not, uh, maybe an electronic calendar isn't it for you. Maybe you need to write and your body needs to write or the electronic calendar does you no good. Maybe you then switch to a paper. Maybe you use both. But just sit there with every like uncomfortable feeling and try something different. And once everything is set up perfectly, it will change. Like expect to, it to fall apart and that it will in fact always fall back together again. And that the more you do these things, the more likely you are to get sustainability in the setups because the the next time you will have learned something about yourself, you will have learned that this doesn't work and that does work. And then the fall apart times will get minimized. But the fact is everything will always, there's nothing permanent. Everything will always fall apart. Uh, if it's terminal, allow yourself to grieve and then figure out the next thing. But most things aren't terminal. Most things are, it turns out that when it gets really, really dark, it, you hate doing this. And so, okay, so don't do it for all of February. Okay, that's fine. Like, but you'll learn that. Like, and, and what happens is, at least for me, I was the youngest of six. I had lots of older brothers and sisters who told me how everything worked. And I was always like, none of it worked. 
fix this way. It took me years to be like, oh, yeah, I have to do it, stab it, realize it doesn't work. For me, I always, you know, got into a catastrophe, like, oh, I can never make this work. But then as time went on, it was really like, oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, shortcut whenever possible. You know, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, for several years, I kept all my kids' shoes in the car and had them go in the house barefoot because I couldn't stand looking for shoes anywhere on our way out the door. <laughs> I love it. We keep our shoes by the door for the same reason, but in the car, that's genius. I could they were supposed to be by the door and I uh -huh. realized I had just had it. Oh, this is a thing that I'm told is ADHD too, but the realization that I should have uh, a dozen dog leashes, some in the car, some by the front, some by the back. Some, I should have a dozen staplers. I should have a dozen fingernail clippers, a dozen tweezers, a dozen pairs of pair of scissors mm -hmm. because one got left out in the rain and I couldn't believe I had this pile of rust that I now couldn't use. Okay. Okay. So some mm -hmm. of that stuff is just like, make it easy on yourself. Yeah. I have two yeah. pairs of the same glasses um, for some other reason and nice. they, they're identical. One of them has blue blocker and one of them doesn't for like photos, but yeah. that has saved so much strife and that stress. So in my life. That's, that's what I haven't done. That is so smart. And if so they made smart. them again, if my prescription changed and, and if they were still making them, I would just get them again. Nice. Nice. Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing, like air on the side of how do I make this just easier for me and easier for everybody? Um, you know, I mean, I grew up with sort of that ethic of like, it has to be hard. It doesn't, it turns out it doesn't. And, and for a lot of people it isn't, and they don't care. Like <laughs> it turns out, which is a version of that. Any idiot can run this thing because there's a lot of people who really don't stress nearly as much as, as I was doing. And the other part of it is everyone's going to be fine. Right. You know? We were talking before we started recording that perfect perfectionism that some people, you know, it's like, well, I finally got to the point where I could just be like, you know what, let's just leave the ums and the uhs and the awkward pauses sometimes in the podcast because I'd rather it just be conversational. Yeah. And I had three therapists tell me I was a perfectionist and I argued with them every time because I was like, I'm not though. like my kids get dirty and it doesn't bother me or like, and they were like, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different kinds of perfectionists. Yep. And you've got the one Absolutely. that like sits there and obsesses about yep. taking the ahs and the ums out of an hour of audio and mm -hmm. you did not have to. And I was yep. like, oh no, I do have that one. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's a lot of it. Like just that, just the, if you're trying something new, like give yourself time to um, be bad at it. You're like, that's the other thing. You're allowed to suck at stuff. Like, I can't tell you how much I used to pay, play classical music as a kid too. And um, I, my mother overscheduled me in a lot of ways, but the fact was, I never felt like I could fail at any of them. Like, and it's really like, uh, you totally are allowed to like, you you can, you can suck at everything. You won't get any better unless you suck now. Um, Pixar hmm. movies, there's some interesting reading on how they make Pixar movies and they always go from a place of suck first. We'll work it out later. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I used to give up on stuff earlier than I probably should have because mm -hmm. I felt like I wasn't any good at it or that it seemed to be maybe not what um, aligned to me. And then, and I would lose sight of the goal. Actually, I think that's probably an even better way is to say, look at I'm not even going to say look at goals and I'm not going to say look at achieve I'm going to say take a little time and figure out how you want to feel and then let everything sort of nudge you towards that feeling so if you want to feel safe what does safety mean well it means um it means a uh reasonable income a sustainable income that um that allows you to pay your bills like mm -hmm. at the very basic so let everything sort of nudge you towards that instead of saying this doesn't work or that doesn't say okay but if my goal is working from home and making a sustainable income then i can put up with boring for taxes for three months or mm -hmm. i can you know or or maybe maybe i can make the dining room into my office and we'll just eat in the kitchen after all or whatever it absolutely is sort of in your way yeah for me I just had to ask myself what do I really really like doing yeah and could I make a job of that and I told someone I just really like talking to people and asking them questions about their lives 
And it just so happened that the lady that I said that to is a resume writer who interviews her guests or not her guests, interviews her clients for one to two hours, sometimes three. Nice. And I'm like, can I interview your guests for you? Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> and she's like, if you write the resumes and so long story short, we, we work together. That's probably what I was doing when I met you um, and focus me. Yeah. I finished that one, by the way. Oh, good, good, good. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I still have the work, like the writing part is the work. That's not my love, but I love helping people after I've gotten to know them. I feel invested mm-hmm. in, you know, their, you know, their pursuit of a new job or a better life. And then it makes that part enjoyable too. Right. It really does. It really does. And I think, I think we are socialized. I mean, I, you know, um, I think even the best school will often just be set up to um, reward people who do well at stuff, whether it came easy to them or not, Mm. Mm -hmm. punish those for whom they didn't do well, Mm. whether it came easy or not in this sort of false grady thing. And then you come out the other side feeling like, I should be prepared for something and I'm not, or my life is insane. My kid yeah. is sick, my kid is well, my dog is throwing up, my dog needs a walk. Like there's just all these variables. And I think it's kind of hard when you're first starting to. But they don't measure all the things. <laughs> they yeah. only measure a few. Yeah. And when you're first starting to work from home, it becomes such a um, irrelevancy. And mm-hmm. it really comes down to how do you feel right now? How do you feel about what you're doing? And are you getting towards that? good feeling you wanted this good feeling of safety this good feeling of you know time maybe. and ironically enough tax preparation might be the kind of work that you would get through for your three months and then it would give you the freedom that you're looking for for the well maybe eight that's, um eight months that's kind of that's kind of the setup for it that is what it is it's actually really interesting you know and it's and it's funny to talk to some tax preparers one of the reasons they became accountants some of them is so that they could work all year round and I'm like, that's great. And now you know, now you know what you're going to do. My, my sweet spot is looking for people who don't want to have the year round nine to five thing mm-hmm. because they have other things they have to do, mm-hmm. whether it's care tasks or art or mentoring or whatever the mm-hmm. things are. Or nonprofit. Or nonprofit, right? Exactly. These, this is a way, a, you know, a legitimate way that you won't lose money doing and yeah. yeah and and can really feed it can it can nourish the rest of the year right um whether it's starting out and it's just a little bit it's funny when i first took business classes years and years and years ago long before i went to business school i was just trying to find out and and this guy was like well you got to grow and you got to this basically all the stuff that you know you you would maybe hear in an mba you certainly hear from like capitalism about mm-hmm. how business works and after a while this class which was like five women stopped him and we were like we just want like an extra 50 bucks a week like that would make so much of a difference with our kids right now and to be able to like get sports equipment that we or otherwise pay for lessons get, or pay for lessons and he was like oh micro businesses let's just change this whole class all of you are interested in micro businesses wow so, yeah. So, and, and, and it was great. I mean, it was a good, it was at a, it was at a um, community development corporation. It was just like a community class, but the fact is a lot of people and a lot, you know, um, I, I've uh, it's, it's not gender specific, but I will say the majority is women who are the caretakers of kids have to find these ways. Mm-hmm. And, um, and to be able to have a place like that, that doesn't harm them in any way, And that they can try out, they can say, oh, actually, that worked out really well. Oh, there's another segment of people that I'm thinking of that might really uh, do well here. Um, The the moms who have to drive their kids to school and pick them up at 8.30 and 3 o'clock. And that means that they can't work a regular 8 to 4 or 9 to 5 job. Um, But they still, oftentimes, once their baby gets to kindergarten, they still have that six hours. That's a really good point. You're still really like, you know, kneecapped by having to work around your kids' schedules. My kids don't have bus school. service. And so we have to drive them. And that's one reason why I'm hodgepodging things together. Um, yeah. I kind of like the hodgepodge because I'm finding things that suit me, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, but it definitely takes you out of, oh my gosh, I know someone. I'm going to tell her about this as soon as I hang up. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yes. 
yeah i mean janet all sorts of things like that you talked about lessons but you know some kids have mm-hmm. like speech pathology or assistance oh, yeah. that they need to get to absolutely how does that fit into nine to five eight to four it just right. does it yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us your contact info. Cause we're going to have to wrap this up. I, <laughs> I have will. another, I have another I episode today. <laughs> well, this has been such a delight. Thanks for, thanks for <laughs> just having that, having the time to chat. As you can tell, I also really love talking to people. We should um, just do it again. <laughs> I would be delighted. It's wonderful to meet a new friend. Thank you. Focus mate. Um, my contact information is the easiest one is info. I N F O at M T S F P. It stands for Massachusetts Tax School for Practitioners. I sometimes tell people it's um, uh, Mark, Thomas, Sophie, uh, Francis, Peter, dot com. Um, and you can ask me questions. You can get clarification. I can walk people through the whole sort of um, trajectory of it. I'm actually working now on a little whiteboard explainer because, again, this is kind of my lower lower time of the, of the year. And... Um, and if you want to see a funny book about bosses, there'll be a link in the show notes. <laughs> there will be. Um, do you also have a website or not? Um, I do actually. So my coaching for my coaching and writing and podcasting when I'm doing it is working nine to thrive.com. And that's with the number nine. Um, yeah. And a thrive. And thrive. Nine to thrive. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Janet. I appreciate it. And I'll just give a shout out to anyone who else, anyone else who might be interested in interviewing like this, um, talking about your life, your work from home experience, who you serve, uh, what you do, um, how you make it work, what you've learned, what you've overcome. Uh, shoot me an email at april at yes, I work from home.com. Or you can go to our guest interest form at www.yesiworkfromhome.com forward slash podcast forward slash guest. Okay. This has been Janet McKenna Lowry with April Malone at Yes, I Work From Home. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Janet. Such a pleasure, April. Thank you so much.